Before we get to our incredible interview with Lori Shaw, just want to mention that you can go to our show notes for expanded notes and details of our interview, including links to Professor Temple Grandin's TED Talks. Go to thisispawprint.com slash 63. We also want to thank Drew Ackerman. He is the host of the Sleep With Me podcast, which at this point is one of the top 50 downloaded podcasts If you read the title, it might make you think that you can actually fall asleep with Drew Ackerman. You can, but more through a online way. Anyways, finally want to mention that our Pitbull series will begin Thursday, August 25th. We have a lot of wonderful interviews lined up, even have a couple of fun giveaways Thursday, August 25th to learn more about Pitbulls. Thanks and on to the show. This is Paw Print, an animal rescue community. Episode 63. I'm Harold Ree. And I'm Nancy Ree. Today's guest is the talented Lori Shaw. Lori owns a pet sitting service in the Ann Arbor, Michigan area called Professional Pet Sitting. She is also a writer with her own blog entitled Animals Unfolded. She shares her journey with us along with animal stories, her thoughts on palliative and hospice care, and teaches Harold some spelling bee words like ethology. I'm Lori Shaw, and I'm owner of Professional Pet Sitting, and I serve the greater Ann Arbor area in Michigan, and I'm also a freelance writer. So how'd you get into the pet sitting business? I actually came into both vocations that I'm doing uh, by osmosis, really. Having owned a residential cleaning service for 20 years, I spent a lot of time in the midst of my clients' pets, and many of them at some point had entered their senior years and end of life. So because the animals were comfortable with me and I knew them really well, it seemed like kind of a natural progression for my clients to ask if I could let them outside if need be or to check on them during the time that they were away at work. How many years were you in residential cleaning? 20 years. 20 years of residential cleaning? (laughs) Yes. And actually, I did uh, commercial as well. So. Oh, my goodness. So did you leave the cleaning service behind completely? I did. In fact... When I was dealing with my own clients' pets, they would ask me to not only handle them when they were away at work, but when they were away on vacation, they would ask if I could take care of their pets. And then before that, it wasn't long before it was word of mouth with their friends and then their friends. And then before I knew it, I had several pets that I was taking care of. So years later, fast forward, although I enjoyed immense success with my cleaning service, at one point I had to start thinking about closing it. Um, I really wanted to spend more time in a way that was more rewarding from there on out. So my pet sitting business really filled that need and more. And of course, along the way, it had proven to be quite sustainable. So as I do with everything else, I use not only my intellect, but my gut. So I went for it. How many years have you been doing the pet sitting service then? Oh, I've been doing it over 10 years. Oh, okay. You kind of say it fulfills a need. Can you give us maybe some examples of how it really does fulfill maybe your heart and and your soul, right? Right, exactly. So pet sitting is not an easy business, but it is something that I call peace work. And with the capital letters in peace, it's incredibly rewarding in that I feel like I'm doing good. I can use my talents. There's a connection with the pets that I really didn't have with my other business, There's this connection that I feel where I just, it's not just with the pets, it's with their families and with the the world at large, really. It's really mentally and spiritually satisfying. And I think that's the biggest part of it. You said around the same time the the, the writing started. Could you maybe explain a little bit more about that? Actually, I became a writer later, but I had gathered so much experience over the years in pet sitting. In fact, I had dealt with so many pets that had behavioral issues, they had health issues, of course, and you encounter a lot of that when you're working with so many of them. But all of the experience that I gained, I felt like I had to really kind of share with others. And I spent a lot of time being active on social media. And I noticed that people had questions about things and they felt comfortable asking me those questions. So I really decided maybe the best venue would be for me to write on my own site, Animals Unfolded. And just kind of, you know, see what was out there that people wanted to know and maybe educate other people in the process. The address is laurieshaw.blogspot.com. Looking just through all your different posts, 
your posts aren't just like, hey, how do I potty train my dog? I mean, you you explore some pretty, uh, some subjects that I think most of us haven't even thought of. And that's my goal, really, is to really get to the nitty gritty of things that are kind of hidden yeah. in the world that we have with our pets. So, you know, a lot of things that I like to talk about, of course, are the human-animal bond, animal behavior, health, ethology, which is something that Temple Grandin has really brought um, she's brought some fantastic work to the forefront in that area. Things like behavioral ecology and probably most importantly, palliative and hospice care and end of life. With our companion animals living longer and healthier, it's really becoming so important. If someone were to look up your blog, if you're going to check out my blog, here's something that I'd like you to take a look at first. What would that be? I think ethology and behavioral ecology. Okay. I think that those things are, are not, um, they're not well defined for people. And when we think in terms of enrichment for our pets and the environment that we provide for them, whether, whether or not they're at home or out in public or whatever, thinking about what it is that they see and how they relate to it and how they react is so key in everything that we do with them every day. Can you actually spell that first word? It sounds like anthology. Anthology. E T H O L O G Y. Gotcha. And Temple Grandin, who is with Colorado State University, is just phenomenal. She's written several books and she's just absolutely fantastic. In fact, a lot of people know her in the autistic community. Oh. And her work with cows and livestock and things of that nature. So, how did you learn about her? I do a lot of research. I really get stuck down a lot of wormholes when I'm researching things. And I came upon um, an article about something that she had kind of created, which is a hugging machine. Actually, it was for herself, and then she applied it to livestock um, to help calm them. And so if you know anything about thunder shirts, that is where that concept had come from. A lot of times, they, you know, autistic people, you know, they, are, they do have issues with touch and sensory input and things like that. But one of the things that Dr. Grandin had discovered in herself is that it calmed her down. And she was wondering if she could apply that same thing to pets. And, of course, you know, the, the thunder shirts and that sort of thing had come into play. And it's really been helpful for a lot of animals. It's not just dogs. Cats also um, benefit from that sort of thing. In fact, I use that frequently, as do many vet offices, when we are administering medication to pets and things of that nature. It does calm them quite a bit to feel wrapped in a towel or, as I call it, burritoing the bunny is uh, one piece that I had written about. So a lot of people frequently will have their pets wear like a thunder shirt when they go to the vet or any stressful situation for that matter. It's not limited to just the storms. But um, like I said, a lot of vet's offices use this technique for rabbits, for cats, other small animals, and it's really, really helpful. Okay. And it makes it less stressful for the, the caregiver and the clinician as well. How did you decide when you started your blog that these were the sorts of topics you were going to explore? Well, I have to say that a lot of my clients, my charges, as I call them, were the inspiration for that. I noticed that I deal with a lot of pets that others won't or can't. And some of them, of course, have been deemed to have behavior issues like aggression which I always question and I actually find is less common than people think. I've had clients kicked out of doggy daycares because the staff had said that the dog was aggressive and they had gotten into fights and things like that. And one thing that I always say when a person will contact me about that, I will say, so tell me about the situation. How did that unfold? You know, a lot of people, especially quote unquote professionals in the field, really can't identify aggression, which I see as the bigger problem. So it's, in many cases, it's just that this dog or dogs, they have an issue being around that many dogs at once. Or when you have different combinations of personalities every, every day, they don't know how to deal with that. And it can be quite challenging. But that doesn't mean that they're aggressive. So um, when I hear things like that from people, it really provides me with fodder for what I need to talk about. Because I think there's so many misconceptions about behavior, about health, and everything, really. So many of us take 
situations like that at face value, right? Like, oh, your dog is mm-hmm. aggressive. Therefore, right. you can't bring him or her to, to doggy daycare any longer. Right, exactly. I mean, there are, you know, there is a percentage of dogs in our population who are aggressive. and But that doesn't mean that they need to be sequestered from everybody else and to have no life outside of their four walls. There's definitely things that we can do to facilitate a nice, you know, environment for them, um, mm. which goes back to the behavioral ecology, as I call it. Um, you know, if we can really try to clarify what's going on in a situation, and it, it, in the end, it really empowers the pet owners, it empowers the dogs, and it empowers the others around them as well. Can you maybe think about an animal who really has played a big part in your life? I do have to say that it's my own pet who have probably been the most impactful. And that's probably because I've kind of gone from cradle to grave with them, so to speak. Mm. So, you know, my cat Silver was only a year old when he was rehomed with me. And Gretchen was, who's a St. Bernard Shepherd mix, who I unfortunately lost a few months ago, just shy of her 16th birthday. She came to me when she was only five weeks old. Um, She was already weaned and taken away from her mother. And I knew that she was the one when I first saw her. She was just so very special. She was incredibly intelligent. And the one thing is that I understood that because she had been taken away from her mother so soon, that Gretchen would need some extra attention when it came to transitioning from being a young puppy to an adult dog. And as it turned out, she was a great puppy who faced little trouble unfolding into a dog who would ultimately become my best teacher and she was just a joy to share life with and you know the only thing that I really feel comfortable taking credit for in that regard was that I was willing to be open and to paying attention and listening to her Um, she was a great communicator and growing with her what I found is what served us best was for me to be able to be fully present in my listening being clear and simple in my communication and willingness to adjust and it really allowed us to forge a bond um, and it empowered me to give her the autonomy that she required to be her happiest and to understand her needs. And, you know, the latter was something that was vital as she entered her final years in a hospice and her end of life, um, because her ability to be empowered to communicate was probably at its most effective then during her final months. And I never felt like I hadn't done enough for her or that I had gone too far in with regard to making decisions that I needed to. And I really couldn't have navigated all of that as effectively without the help of my own vet, Dr. Kathy Tyson and Dr. Monica Turan, who Monica is a fantastic hospice vet and she's also a veterinary acupuncturist. So having all that experience with her and just going through all the phases of her life and seeing how she reacted to things. It helped me really be more open to other animals and what they might be experiencing and learning how to listen a lot better. She was part of your life for 16 years. That means she was actually Mm -hmm. part of your life before you even made the transition from your previous business into, into what you currently do. Exactly. And I think that was the beauty of it. And in order to really work with animals and do it for a living, you have to really love it. It's not something that you do because you want to make money. (laughs) <laughs> you know, that can't be your motivation. Your motivation has to be trying to make a better life for animals. And that is really my my mission, my mission statement. During your years of uh, pet sitting or house clean, cleaning even, ha- just have you ever noticed a difference between pets that were rescued versus pets that were from a, a breeder? Not really, actually. I mean, I have to say that, you know, there are categories of of pets, of course, that have been rescued from a rescue or a shelter. There's some who, like in my case, they were from you know private owners who just couldn't or didn't want to handle them anymore. And then, of course, there are people who decide to use a breeder. And there's some who use, and this is something that we do have a problem with in this area in Michigan, especially in the rural areas to the north, are the puppy mills. I do see a difference in that demographic. But overall, I think that because our community has such a good handle on how to care for their pets properly with their behavior and their health and everything, that there is more of a blurred line as opposed to seeing like a definite like, oh, this is a rescue dog. They have problems or they have this going on or that. And I think that's a really good thing. What does it take to be a great 
pet sitter or or run a great <laughs> pet sitting business? It's funny you ask. I get I get approached about that a lot. In fact, um, I get a lot of people who are very unsatisfied with what they do for a living. And I will say that it's positive and fun. It's also a lot of responsibility. You have to be able to multitask. You know, you have a very unconventional schedule. Uh, you have to really excel at time management, organization. You have to think outside the box in terms of having a life. The hours can be quite long. In fact, I'm up pretty early every day and often retire late into the evening. And you have to like to be spending time in the car. It, you spend a lot of time driving from appointments to appointment. It's one of the most rewarding things, but you really do have to know a lot. It's knowing about behavior with animals, especially dogs, knowing about pet health. Understanding when there's a problem, not being afraid to speak up when you notice that there's something going on. I will say that I've had pets pass away under my care. Uh, they were ill and it was expected. So you really do have to be prepared to have fun. You have to be prepared to be able to know how to deal with clients who are having a tough time um, in terms of their pet's health and where they're at in their life. I've had a lot of people say, oh, well, I'll just take on X, Y, and Z clients. And I'm like, well, they're going to age out and they're going to have problems when they get older. It's, it, it can be very heart-wrenching. Any stories that really come to mind in that case? Yes. In fact, I, I had a client a couple of years ago who was, I think, about six or seven years old, Charlie, who was a beautiful cat. And um, unbeknownst to anybody, he had had congestive heart failure which was congenital. Um, he didn't show symptoms until at least the last week or so of his life. And it was totally unexpected. Just trying to go through day by day and working with the client. And unfortunately at that time they were traveling um, mm -hmm. for their work. So it was like, you know, they were kind of stuck in between two places. And fortunately they had help, of course, navigating that with family and stuff. But, um, it was a very poignant moment, and I do remember when my client had returned home, they had another cat who was a sibling to the one who had passed away, and the reunion of those two, the bond that they had was just extraordinary. When they saw each other for the first time, it was just everything had changed for them. What was it like for you to actually observe this reunion? It was one of those things that you just felt like you... You just wanted to give them the space that they needed. You, did, you felt like you always wanted to be a fly on the wall, not be seen. Um, and it was just, it, it was, the energy in the room was so, it was so positive and it was sad at the same time because there was this human who missed their cat so much and had this really awful thing happen. And here's the cat who is suddenly without their sibling. And now they had to try to figure out how to kind of meet each other again in, in a totally different kind of, you know, family structure. Right. Um, and it was, it was, it was very poignant. It was very tender. And I honestly, I will always cherish knowing that that, oh, it was just so, it was, it just, it made me happy to know that to see people care so much and to be able to not be afraid to have this emotion. Sounds like in your in your line of work, you, you run into that on a fairly regular basis. Mm -hmm. I do, actually. Um, it's interesting. I've actually kind of specialized in clients who are going into their twilight years. Um, I will say a lot of people contact me then because they do need the extra help, especially when they're traveling. And they really need somebody who's knowledgeable and you know, isn't afraid to deal with stuff like this. So I, I would like to see more people get involved. What makes you attracted to palliative care, end of life care? I mean, what, what kind of draws you to it? I have a firm belief that every living thing deserves to die with dignity and, you know, care and being surrounded with love and to be as free of pain as they can. I am learning more and more about what can be done, what the trends are in the industry when, what we're learning about what we can do. I think because pets are living healthier longer, they're going to experience these difficult parts of their end of life. And that it is okay to say, I can't do this, to just decide to let them go. 
you know, approaching those issues is so, so important because I really want people to feel empowered by the experience. It can be so, so difficult. And I can say from my own experience with Gretchen's passing that I had not come away feeling like I waited too long or that I didn't address anything. I felt a huge gift that I I had been given. I think that it's a thing that people are becoming more conscious of, not just with humans, but because we're living so closely with pets, being able to approach loss with them and being able to handle palliative and hospice care is vital. It, It does take time. It does take guts. You do cry a lot as a pet owner. You do have moments where you think I can't do this and it's okay. So empowering people to face that is just, it's the most rewarding part of what I do. Your clients are lucky to have you, Lori. Oh gosh, thanks. It's just, it's a wonderful way to spend time. I can tell you. Switching now to your blog and we're talking to Lori Mm -hmm. Shaw, Lori Shaw dot blogspot.com is how you find her blog. Who do you envision your audience to be for your, your animal blog? I will say that I have had so many people contact me by email and it'll be in the middle of the night or early in the morning. And it is people who are looking for answers for things. They are often kind of at their wit's end with a behavior problem. They are trying to navigate end of life. They're trying to figure out how they can. And this is a situation that I see frequently where there's conflict in the family amongst the members of how to handle a situation where everyone's not on board with addressing a certain issue and people are looking for answers. So I think that there are people across the board. It can be a behavioral, it can be a health issue. And in fact, one of the things that I am going to write about more and I think is so important is in the, um, in the pet rescue and the veterinary fields is that self-care is vital. People don't know how to deal with the stuff that they see with their own pets. Sometimes don't know, they don't know what to expect. And when they're faced with a situation and they don't know how to deal with it mentally after the fact, I've actually gotten lots of emails from people like that. And that's an area that I am kind of gravitating toward. Um, And I think it kind of goes hand in hand with the whole hospice and rescue communities You know, we did see, we do see a high suicide rate in the veterinary field and the pet rescue field. And we did see that with the renowned veterinary behaviorist, Dr. Sophia Yin, a couple of years ago who committed suicide, unfortunately. We see it with cruelty and rescue workers and trainers and behaviorists and even pet sitters. I love everything that you're saying because when you think of animal rescue, uh, one one of the phrases that comes with animal rescue is giving the voice to the voiceless. But what right. you, but what you do is so much even more than that, right? It's it's you're giving voice to maybe concerns that none of us really has, at least on a conscious level. Maybe subconsciously mm-hmm. we have have these right. concerns, but but sometimes, unfortunately, just like you, you've already mentioned, it, it sometimes doesn't really manifest itself until it's too late and someone's mm-hmm. committed suicide or mm-hmm. or they've committed some kind of violent act, which. Mm -hmm. which it's like, where the heck did this come from, right? So Right, right. And if you think about what goes along with it, too, sometimes alcoholism, um, people will sometimes gravitate towards coping skills that aren't so healthy. And then, of course, that just mushrooms into bigger problems for society. Mm -hmm. And that's my premise, is to keep everybody, you know, give them empowerment all over. And it just, there's always, like, different things that I find that can be useful or helpful or need focus. What was your childhood like? Did you have animals? Um, did you always uh, dream yes. of um, taking care of animals? <laughs> I grew up with my dad and my mom and my brother. We always had animals. In fact, early in my life, my dad was a canine. He was a police officer on a canine unit. And we wow. had police dogs that would come home. Yes, it was just, just delightful. What's the best way for folks to, to, to look you up, Lori? Whether it's your professional pet sitting service, uh, mm-hmm. your blog. Right, yeah. Well, I have a huge presence on social media. I can be found on Twitter at, at PSA2. I'm on there almost every day. Um, in fact, if I'm not active on one day, somebody's asking where I'm at. <laughs> it's just a fun environment. <laughs> it's a really great format. I love it. I'm also on Facebook at 
facebook.com slash professional pet sitting. Um, I can be reached on my blog, which is probably the best place. And that, as you said, is laurieshaw.blogspot.com. And generally, that's the best place. I'm also on Google+. Plus, and I can always be reached by email and phone. People are, you know, I always welcome contact from people. If you were to ever wave a magic wand over the state of whether it's animal rescue or any sort of related uh, populations that that you come into contact with, what, what would you do with that magic wand? One of the things that I'm probably most passionate about is talking about the issues surrounding pet homelessness. Mm. Because I think if we get to the core of that and really get people to understand why that exists, we will have less of a need for pet rescues. Mm. And we will have less of a need for cruelty workers because, first of all, how important spay and neuter is and how early pets can reproduce in their lives and how often, (laughs) especially cats. And I I think that if we can get to the root of that and just wave a magic wand and say, okay, everybody, let's really understand why this stuff happens, we can really just squash out all the other problems. I would like nothing more than to put animal rescues out of business. If there was no need for them, it would be great. That's right. I'm glad they're there, but I'm so sorry that there have been such a, there's been such a need for it. Spay and neuter is like the top, the top thing. If we can get to that where you can have low cost spay and neuter, free spay and neuter, um, you know, when you've got the trap, neuter and rescue with cat colonies. That does so much. That's and right. it's a public it's a public health issue, too, if people don't realize it yeah. affects everyone. It sounds like you feel like you have a very fulfilling life right now when it comes to mm-hmm. the animal part of, of your life. Mm-hmm. I do. I really do. And I wouldn't trade what I do for anything. It's just, it's a lot of work. It can be really hard sometimes. But, you know, what they say, nothing worthwhile is ever easy. That's right. And I really am one of the luckiest people to be able to do this for a living. We want to say thank you to Lori Shaw for sharing her story. If you want to find ways to communicate with Lori, you can go to our show notes at thisispawprint.com slash 63. If you'd like to nominate someone to be a future guest on Pawprint, you can go to our contact page at thisispawprint.com slash contact. If you'd like to listen to more episodes of Paw Print, you can listen to your favorite podcast app, such as iTunes, SoundCloud, Overcast, and YouTube. Make sure to hit subscribe to get the latest episodes immediately. Find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Simply look for This Is Paw Print, all one word. We want to say thank you to all of you for sharing Paw Print with your friends and family. And remember that you spread a positive message of love and peace by saving an animal. Have a great day, everyone. And see you next time with another great guest on Paw Print. Paw Print is a production of EVER Education. You can't handle the truth.